This clip is about the Agile development process. Though there are many different kinds of Agile processes, I'll mainly talk about Scrum today. In February 2001, 17 software developers met in Snowbird, Utah. During this informal meeting, they talked about flexible ways to develop software. These 17 developers all represented different Agile trends that aim to develop software with minimal bureaucracy. Together they wrote the Agile Manifesto and the principles behind it. Officially, Agile isn't a process but a collection of processes. There are many of them, such as Extreme Programming, Scrum, Adaptive Software Development and Kanban. These methods all try to minimize bureaucracy in some way while developing software. Many of these methods have been separately developed in the 80s and 90s by several experts and finally in 2001 wrote the Agile Manifesto that you can read on this slide. There are a few principles behind Agile processes. The team organizes itself to improve communication and interaction within the team. The aim is to regularly deliver working software, preferably every few weeks, minimally every few months. Working products are the most important measure of progress. Integrate the customer in the progress and let them provide feedback that improves the product. Agile welcomes change, even late in the process. Though there is some overlap between UP and Agile processes, they are quite different. UP is an iterative top-down approach. The idea is to carefully think about requirements and design beforehand, so we can minimize change later on and avoid bad surprises. Agile, on the other hand, is an iterative top-down, bottom-up approach. The aim of Agile is to keep things simple by minimizing development work. This is done by involving users in each iteration and making those iterations small, like a few weeks per iteration. As we discussed earlier, there are several Agile methodologies. There's actually an Agile version of UP that takes the main insights from Agile while still trying to follow the original structure of UP. Nowadays, this is not used anymore. It's been superseded by other, more Agile methodologies. By far the most widely used method is Scrum. So in the remainder of this presentation, I will focus on Scrum what the process looks like, what roles there are, and what the outcomes are. First, here's a diagram explaining the whole Scrum process. We'll go through each of these parts in the following slides. A key ingredient of the Scrum pipeline is user stories. A user story is a brief description of a feature normally told from the perspective of the person who would like to have this feature. A user story contains the type of user that the story is for, what this user wants, and why the user wants this. Next to these user stories, Scrums also know something called an epic. An epic is also a user story, but it's generally more high level and contains larger amounts of functionality. Epics should be split up into smaller user stories that can be completed in a single iteration, also called a sprint. An example of an epic is that a user wants to be able to back up their hard drive. You can then construct specific user stories around that. A power user should be able to specify which files and folders to back up based on properties such as file size and dates. A basic user should be able to just indicate which folders should be backed up and which shouldn't be. The user stories are specific and are part of the functionality described in the epic. In order to check the quality of a user story, you can use the invest checklist. A user story should be independent, so you can build it without side effects. It should be negotiable. The team should be able to decide until what level the feature can be implemented. It should be valuable, estimable, so you can indicate how much time building it will take. It should be small, so it fits into a single iteration. And it should be testable, so you can determine if it works as it should. 
Like up, Scrum is iterative, but iterations are called sprints. Sprints should have the same length, normally somewhere between two and four weeks. At the beginning of the sprint, the team decides what they're going to work on. This determines the scope, which cannot be changed during the sprint. The first part is called the sprint planning. It involves a discussion to determine what items a team will work on during the sprint. These items come from a product backlog. More about that later. The results of the sprint planning is a sprint backlog. Next to deciding which items will be in the sprint backlog, you also plan the specific tasks needed to deliver these items. So if a sprint backlog item is to add a password reset mechanism to the login screen, then tasks could be to design the password reset interface, create a mail sending mechanism, and build the business logic for sending and receiving password reset tokens. During the sprint, the team coordinates their work every day. They use the daily scrum for that, or daily stand-up. This should be a short meeting where you discuss practical issues to make sure there are no bottlenecks. For example, a developer discovers she has to wait for the designer to finish the GUI and in the daily scrum then decides to already start working on the back-end logic instead. At the end of the sprint, the results are discussed with all the stakeholders. This allows the team to get feedback on what they did to show the output of the sprint and to consider the effects on the planning for the next sprint. There's also a sprint retrospective. The sprint review is mainly focused on the outcome of the sprint. What did we build and what is it that the customer wanted? The retrospective deals with the process. Did we follow the agile process correctly? Are there team members who can improve the way they work during the sprint? How can we work and communicate better overall? The retrospective should introduce at least one action to include in the next sprint to ensure the team always focuses on improvement and fine-tuning the process. Just like up, Scrum also delivers artifacts. One of them is the product backlog. The product backlog is an ordered list, normally in order of importance, of all the possible changes that could be made to the software. These items are options, not commitments. A product backlog is a changing document. Depending on what happens during the sprint, items may be removed from the backlog because they're no longer relevant. So putting something in the backlog doesn't guarantee that it will be done. The product owner is responsible for maintaining the backlog and make sure it's up to date. I'll talk more about this role and other roles in Scrum in a minute. The sprint backlog is a collection of items from the product backlog that's created at the beginning of each sprint. Also, the sprint backlog contains specific tasks that need to be done to deliver these items. And finally, there are two more artifacts in Scrum. The definition of them and the increment. Each product backlog item should have a definition of done that explains the criteria an item must meet before it's considered done. For instance, if a product backlog item is to add a password reset mechanism, the definition of done could be that there is a user interface for it, that the system sends password reset mails, and that it can generate and process password reset tokens. The increment is the collection of items that meet the definitions of done at the end of the sprint. The increment may be released at that point, or the product owner can decide to further build upon it in the next sprint. Here's an overview of a few different but important roles in Scrum. I'll go into each of them in more detail now. First, we have the product owner. The main task of the product owner is to manage the product backlog. The product owner uses the product backlog to give the development team direction in where the software product is headed. 
There's also the Scrum Master. This person is responsible for making sure the development process stays agile. For example, if one of the developers proposes that daily scrums could be skipped so the team has more time to work on the code, then the Scrum Master should decide whether this is a good idea. Hint, probably not. The Scrum Master does not have authority about the product direction, but has more of a coaching role. And finally, there's the development team. These are the people that actually perform the tasks identified in the sprint backlogs. The development team itself decides how to divide the tasks. There are many supporting software tools for Scrum. There are tools such as Atlassian's Jira that directly couple the Scrum processes to development activities. You can also go for something more open uh, such as Trello to track tasks, backlogs and more. So we've now seen several different development processes. One thing is clear, software development is hard. Although an agile process is by far the most popular choice at this time, there are many varieties that you can use. There is no clear winner, each has their advantages and disadvantages. From my personal experience, the most important aspect is to not be afraid to experiment. If you begin a new project, Scrum is a great starting point. Read about the alternatives and try to incorporate aspects of them in your process to see what works and what doesn't. In the end, it's not about the process. It's about making sure that you deliver results. Please post any questions or suggestions you have in the Teams channel of this course. Also, if you find other interesting articles or discussions online about Agile, feel free to post the link in the Teams channel. Thanks for watching and catch you in the next one.